Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. I was checking my statistics and it turns out that only one of you guys aren't subscribed. So if you don't want to be that one holdout, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our first story of the day is by Derpasaurus. Want me to speak to your insurance? Sure. Enjoy an at fault claim on your policy. I work as an auto insurance adjuster for simple claims. For some background, one of the most complicated type of claims that I deal with are backing claims like a person backing out of a space or similar. This is because backing claims have a potential for shared responsibility depending on location of damage, statements, and so on. Typically for backing claims, it's crucial to take a very specific statement from both drivers to see the scene, even if virtually, and review the damage on both cars to determine liability. I received a claim, CV backed into IV. This means the claimant or other person backed into my person. Usually in most backing claims, there's a claim open on both insurance companies so they can each do their own investigation. Additionally, there's a process for billing the other company once liability's been determined. So insurance companies often speak during this process. It was day 5 for me and I haven't been able to reach either my insured or the claimant after several texts, calls, and emails to both parties. My last call attempt for the day to the claimant and I got an answer. I was immediately cut off before I could even finish introducing myself. She essentially stated that she will not speak to me at all and that I'll have to speak to her insurance. I asked if she had an open claim and a claim number to save me the trouble and she stated, I'm not in a place to provide you that at this time. I briefly mentioned just wanting to take her statement and that her insurance would want to do the same. But she doubled down and told me she will absolutely not speak to me before disconnecting the call. Okay, fine. I then found her insurance company, confirmed she hadn't opened a claim yet, then opened a claim on her behalf. I disclosed the information that I knew, location of damage on both cars, and the original facts of loss. Claimant backed into my insured. Her insurance agreed with me over the phone that it sounded like the claimant was most likely at fault. But obviously they'll do their own investigation. Location of damage alone paints a very clear picture. Damage on the claimant rear bumper and damage to my insured's rear door is typically always 100% at fault on the backing party because they owe the greater duty to yield right of way and to maintain proper lookout. Fast forward an hour and I got a call from my insured. She told me that she'd been speaking with the claimant for several days and they were negotiating an out of pocket solution. Now, this is normal and some people do this, but if the claimant had just told me that in the first place, I wouldn't have had to have filed an at-fault claim on her insurance. If you know anything about insurance, the claimant's ultimate goal was to avoid her premiums from going up. But now, she'll have an at-fault claim on her policy that will certainly taint her records. Enjoy! I'm kind of curious, do you guys blame the claimant for what they did here? Obviously their main goal was to try to get out of getting an insurance claim or something, basically prevent their premiums from going up. What they did was totally the wrong way to go about it, but do you really blame them? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Shepling. I now operate as a human slackbot at work. I work for an IT services company as an internal recruiter. Without going into detail, the roles I recruit for and the location I'm in are very challenging to fill right now for a number of reasons. So I'm utilized outside my geographical region and availability zones, hint, I also remotely service two other regional divisions. For whatever reason, stakeholder relationships with remote regions have been better than my own local region. I have one particular stakeholder who, for whatever reason, would prefer to spend energy and time going over minute, irrelevant details in an interrogative manner. My other meetings are more productive, less hostile, and certainly peer-to-peer. Anyway, things came to a head after months of me politely dealing with this person. This week, I pulled up my JIRA board, started working through the roles, and before starting specifically, started talking in general terms about a particular skill set I was seeing in one regional area that I wanted to highlight as potentially being able to work a remote project in another. It was a general open statement designed to encourage conversation. I didn't get halfway through the sentence when the stakeholder says, Excuse me, but what relevance is this to the JIRA board? What rec number does this relate to? So I started to repeat that, no, it wasn't specific to a particular role, as I said. I just wanted to make you aware of these people as part of the meeting before I got this far and was told, just stick to the process and work through the board. Okay. 
So I started to do this, and she literally started talking over me to another person in the room about something else. This was over teams, so I couldn't quite hear what they were saying, so I stopped talking and waited. As soon as I stopped, please continue to work through the rec cards. Without making this long-winded, essentially every time I spoke, I got shut down completely. It's hard to get across how extreme this was in text now, but it was highly confronting and I had no idea why this was happening. The meeting finished, I got a Slack message telling me I was distant and confrontational and needed to stick to the process. As an adult, I examined my behavior and thought I was definitely distant, but basically was being closed down unless I just parroted a script. So from that day, I now respond to everything over Slack as a human Slack bot. Where I was conversational, I just respond acknowledging the content and tagging the rec number as per the process. If I get asked a question, I respond with exactly the information requested. No pleasantries, no independent comment or personality, and tag that with a reference to whatever Jira rec it responds to. If someone asks me a general question, I ask for the rec number in Jira it relates to in order to best answer their query. Rinse and repeat. I'm super enjoying sticking to the process, and the stakeholder literally has no idea what to do now as I'm doing exactly as they asked. Any human decisions or point of view required, or recommendations asked for, I'll reply by quoting the section of the process that applies. This is having an unforeseen effect with the other people in this channel. Some are outright ignoring me now, or others who used to not really bother to connect in the channel are trying to engage on a personal level, but hey. I'm a human slackbot now who sticks to the process, and this action was performed automatically. Don't you love that sometimes in the workplace, people just want you to act like a robot and do as a robot, until they no longer want you to be a robot? Right when they start with their small talk and their own pleasantries like, Hey buddy, long weekend, huh? I'm sorry, is there a Jira rec that responds to how my weekend went? Syntax error, syntax error. Our next story is by Spoods McBeef. My boss demanded I serve all customers and fill all shelves no matter how far past closing hours it was. So my first job I ever worked at for a few years was a grocery retail store with several different departments including a deli for lunch meat and cheese which is where I worked. One night I was working 1pm to 9pm. 9pm is when the deli and other special departments closed and were expected to be done and clocked out but the rest of the store remained open 24-7 for general groceries. It was me and one other guy, we had an especially busy night, and we were a little behind on our cleaning as a result, but we had our meat slicing machines already coated with sanitizer after working for 15 minutes to get all the little meat chunks and shavings out of every corner, as we were pretty serious about making sure those things were clean as can be. It's about 8.55 at this point, we're almost late to leave, and the store we worked for did not like overtime. If you were getting any amount of overtime, you would get chewed out the next day for it, even for a little amount. A woman walks up to the counter and starts looking through the product, as we had a glass case filled with a bunch of types of our lunch meats, pre-sliced and ready to go for bagging up. She looks at one and says, I want this turkey right here, but I want it freshly sliced. I of course look to my coworker, and we both can see the two slicers we have are still covered in the sanitizer we use and are drying. As per the food safety protocol written on the bottle, it says to allow 20 to 30 minutes minimum for the sanitizer to dry after application. I tell her, well ma'am, we really can't do that right now. Our slicers are both being clean at the moment as the department's closed in 5 minutes, but I'd be glad to get you something here from our cold case. So you're not gonna slice it fresh for me, that's what you're saying? I replied, that's correct, I apologize. Without another word, she walks away and myself and coworker go back to what we were doing, and we finish cleaning and go home after about 5 more minutes, narrowly clocking out on time. Fast forward 2 days later, me and the same coworker come in and start getting to work like a normal day. About 3pm, 2 hours into my shift, I personally get called into the head honcho's office, the store director as they're titled. I think nothing of it and head on upstairs and go inside the office and sit down. The store director hands me a piece of paper and says, tell me what caused this. I look at the paper and it's a printed out screenshot of a Google review for our store, one star out of five, 
and a full paragraph from that lady from two nights before complaining that she didn't get her freshly sliced meat from the rude employee and then described specifically me. I explained exactly what happened two nights prior as clearly as I'm typing it out here. The director is getting heated and begins to cut me off while I'm speaking, asking, why would slicers be covered in sanitizer at 8.55? You're scheduled to work until 9 p.m. I said, yes I am, but seeing as I'm constantly being reminded not to get any overtime, I usually start cleaning them around 8.30. The director gets even more upset and raises her voice. I don't care, that's not how it works. If you have a customer, you serve them. And you better start making sure those shells are filled before you leave or you won't be working here anymore. Now get out. I'm pretty salty at this point. I go back down to the department and my coworker asked what happened and I told him. He says, so they want everything done before we leave? I said, yep. And without another word, he knew what we needed to do. 9pm hits as usual and our shells are at the usual standard of half full. But seeing as we've been given a new standard, we decided to stay and make sure we did what I was instructed to do. We spent the next several hours past closing time slicing and slicing and slicing until every tray of meat and cheese was full. We had plastic totes in the big fridge full of cheese that we sliced that were wrapped up in half pound blocks for ease of sale. So we decided to fill that tub over the brim with every single type of cheese we had available. We cut up around 70 pounds of cheese and wrapped it up in the fridge. We also had a Subway style sandwich counter where we made sandwiches to order and also pre-made on the shelves for sale. We made double the usual amount of sandwiches and filled the shelves as per requested. Not a single shelf had a single empty spot on it by the time we were done. After every single possible item and shelf was as full as could be, we finally started to clean and close. It was around 3 a.m. when we finally left. The department opens at 5 a.m. We were exhausted, but our spiteful overtime venture made us feel pretty good. We got about six hours overtime in. They hated anyone even getting five to ten minutes of overtime. We both came in the next day at 1 p.m. as usual, expecting complete retaliation. But nope. Instead, our department manager of the deli kind of saunters over to us and says, Hey, uh... You should be good to start cleaning at 8.30 like usual. I think she, the director, got the point you made. Normally, overtime would be asked to be taken care of by clocking out for lunches or coming in later than usual, but they let us keep all six hours of that overtime. They never said anything to us about overtime again after that. I accepted a job that paid almost double about six months after this incident and never ever went back to retail heck. This is just all around a really solid malicious compliance, and that's not just because I really love meat and cheese. Just all the hard work and care and dedication into making sure you do exactly what they asked, and then they realize, oh, there's a reason they pack up at 8.30. And our final story of the day is by Mr. Bowties. Manager changed my schedule as a power move, so I stuck to it. A few years ago, I worked at a physical media chain in New England. My location was new, so when I was hired, I was interviewed by the district manager and a higher up because the manager hadn't been hired yet. When I applied, I made a very small window for availability, but I was also willing to close or work later shifts and work all weekends, so they agreed. And even though it was a set schedule, I did come in multiple times to cover someone else. The manager they hired was an absolute control freak. It didn't start bad, but it got ridiculous. She hated the fact that I had a set schedule, not because I was needed at other times. I was working the least desirable shifts. It was because she didn't control it. She even said that. About a year and a half of working there, and her dropping hints that we might need to renegotiate my schedule again for no actual reason, she scheduled me to come in four hours earlier on the day before my weekend just to shake things up. I brought it up and she told me to make plans, essentially just get over it. I was mad but I did just that. My wife and I planned a date night when I would have normally been working. On the day in question, I get a call saying that the person who was closing that night instead of me, she swapped me with a less reliable employee, had called in sick and I needed to come in on my normally scheduled time. I was so happy to tell them that I was sorry but couldn't change in such short notice because I would made plans. 
The assistant manager, who was just as giddy as the manager was to tell me about the shakeup, had to do a split shift and cancel a Tinder date because I did as I was told and made plans instead of being upset. That's just absolutely what they get for being a control freak. Some weirdo that's like, I have to control you or else I'm not satisfied with my managerial position. Let me just totally shuffle your week just to shake things up. They didn't realize OP's working the least desirable shifts for a reason. They're reliable, they work extra. Nope, no logic here. Just had to control things. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.